Folks, you've got your scriptures. John 8 is our passage for today. And by the by, as we uh, start proper our, our first uh, in this series of Thinking Like Jesus, we looked at last week, remember, uh, being metamorphosed. Remember the rock types that we went through with geology? You had so much fun, didn't you? Yes, yeah. of course we did. Mm. Oh, yeah. Now, metamorphose means to change form, and it's a rock that exists that changes uh, because of heat or pressure or a combination of both. And uh, metamorphose is the word that's used by Paul when he says, but let your minds not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. That's the word. Have a change of form of your thinking from being a cookie cutter like the world to something completely different. And the renewing in the Greek means to have a renovation, to be made fresh. And let Jesus renovate your thinking, and in that way you will be transformed. We looked at and contrasted the, the death of worldly thinking and how Romans, uh, more than any other New Testament book, describes the mind, and that it is death, that it is hostile, that it has exchanged the glory and knowledge of God for itself and for idolatry in general. And we looked at, uh, we have a knowledge problem as fallen people. We have a will problem that our thinking is more than just getting good knowledge. It's our will as well, because you can have a Bible in front of somebody and have the right knowledge, but if their will refuses this and says, no, that's not for me, then you're not going to be thinking after Jesus. Thinking is more than just right knowledge. It is a will problem. And that we saw that God has handed us over, therefore, as a humanity to drink in the sin that we prefer over the knowledge of him. And so we looked at if we're going to be thinkers like Jesus, then we need the reversal of those three problems. We need God in his grace, not that we deserve it, nor that he needs to, but in his grace to hand us not over to sin anymore, but hand us over to Jesus. And we saw that he needs to address our stubborn wills, which uh, rebel and are hostile and do not submit, and to soften them so that we will submit to what he calls wrong, I agree with, what he calls right, I come into agreement with that and I'm not going to fight you on it. And of course we need the truth, we need the knowledge that he has revealed of himself. And you might remember in Romans 6, 17, we looked again at that word, that phrase, handed over, that we've been handed over to the teaching of the Scriptures. Not the Bible handed to us, but we have been handed over to the truth of God's revealed knowledge. That's quite a thing. So it behoves us then to use our mind, how do we think like Jesus increasingly within a culture that is not thinking like God at all? And very much epitomises what Paul said in Romans. It will not submit to God. It is hostile to God. It is in rebellion to him. It is completely different to the mind controlled by the spirit. And so this morning we're going to consider John 8. And by the way, I know some of you are, are taking notes. Uh, if you would like to email the PowerPoint that I'm going to show this morning, if you want to email me and grab that, that will save you a lot of uh, ink because uh, you won't be able to write down everything as we go through, okay? So just send me an email and I'll send you the PowerPoint that we're going to use this morning. But in John 8, we have these words, and what we're going to consider today in the first of our thinking like Jesus is all about our identity, who I am, my purpose, why am I here, and my life direction, where am I going? Because before anything else we look at in thinking like Jesus, if we can't answer those three questions, nothing else really matters. And Jesus answered those things in spades here in John chapter 8. Starting from verse 12, look at these words with me as I read. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The Pharisees challenged him. Here you are, appearing as your own witness. Your testimony is not valid. Jesus answered, 
Even if I testify on my own heart, behalf, rather, my testimony is valid, for I know where I came from and where I am going. But you have no idea where I come from or where I'm going. You judge by human standards. I pass judgment on no one. But if I do judge, my decisions are right, because I am not alone. I stand with the Father who sent me. In your own law, it is written that the testimony of two men is valid. I am one who testifies for myself. My other witness is the Father who sent me. Then they asked him, well, where's your father? You do not know me or my father, Jesus replied. If you knew me, you would know my father also. He spoke these words while teaching in the temple area near the place where the offerings were put. Yet no one seized him because his time had not yet come. Once more Jesus said to them, I will die in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. This made the Jews ask, Oh, will he kill himself? Is that why he says, Where I go, you cannot come? But he continued, You are from below, I'm from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. And I told you that you would die in your sins if you do not believe that I am the one I claim to be. You will indeed die in your sins. Who are you? They asked. Just what I've been claiming all along, Jesus replied. I have much to say in judgment of you, but he who sent me is reliable. And what I've heard from him, I tell the world. They did not understand that he was telling them about his father. So Jesus said, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am the one I claim to be, and that I do nothing on my own but speak just what the Father has taught me. The one who sent me is with me, he has not left me alone, for always I do what pleases him. And even as he spoke, many put their faith in him. So we are asking that you would speak, Lord, so that our faith in you would be strengthened. And Lord, that you'd make good your word in changing our thinking and therefore our outlook of what it means to be a child of God, we pray. Amen. In 2006, this book was published, Eat, Pray, Love. And it was written by a journalist and a, a bit of a, a theme writer called Elizabeth Gilbert. And very much was a, a year of her life and uh, she was a lady who uh, was uh, in a marriage. They had it all. He had a very rich job. She was doing well. They had a, the apartment in Manhattan, New York, and a, a big house somewhere else nearby. And uh, seemed to have all the trimmings and all the things that you would want in life. But she was very miserable in a marriage. And so she left and fell in love with an actor. Uh, and that quickly fell apart as well. And she came to the conclusion that uh, she was very much the problem. She was her own problem, and so she was going to take a year out to find herself, like many seek to do. And so she went to three countries. Each of those had a theme. The first is that she went to Italy, and she uh, explored the, the, the top and bottom of the country, in Sicily as well, and rediscovered her passion for food, hence eat. And after four months there, meeting many friends, she went to India uh, to take up, again, uh, instruction with a yogi that she had been introduced to while she was going out with this actor uh, months before. And so that was a season of prey, of uh, seeking her meaning and identity in religion. After that time, it was about three months, she then went to Bali. And she had some friends there, and while she was there, she met and fell in love with a, a Brazilian guy and married him, hence love. So eat, pray, love. With that marriage, with that Brazilian guy, it lasted 12 years until uh, a good friend of theirs, uh, a lady who was dying of cancer, well, Elizabeth fell in love with her. And so she terminated that marriage and had an 18 month uh, civil ceremony marriage with this lady until she died. And then Elizabeth went into a, a series of other relationships and I think she's got uh, a guy that's sort of um, is stable for the moment. But I don't put Elizabeth up there to lampoon her or make fun of her or anything like that. But that something that's well known, and you may have seen the movie Eat, Pray, Love with Julia Roberts playing Elizabeth's uh, role. 
But Center Life is indicative of so many millions around the world who are desperately trying to find out who are they. What's it mean that I am who I am? Who am I? And we look at in, in all sorts of areas and places. And for most people, we try and find a label that somehow will stick and that sums up who I am. So it may be in food, it may be in religion, it may be in love. It may be in these other places too. It could be with your politics. And we've seen, particularly with the US election, how extreme people get when their, their whole identity is tied up in what political persuasion they have. For many, their identity is tied up in their profession. I'm a teacher, I'm a plumber, I'm an engineer, I drive buses. That's who I am. It could be your race. My prime identity is my aboriginality, or I'm Asian, or I'm this country or that. It could be a cause, Black Lives Matter, Extinction Rebellion, so many others where people are, are passionate, but their passion has wound up in that that is very much who they are. And even for us as believers and pastors particularly, I know my identity because of what I do in ministry. My ministry is my identity. I'm somebody because I'm a pastor. That is idolatry. Okay? So even pastors and Christians are not immune from tying up their identity in their ministry, what they do. And of course, what's fashionable today is my sexuality. That's who I am. And don't offend me. Where the spirit of offence, as though I deserve to be offended if you don't agree that my identity is tied up in being lesbian, gay, bisexual, transsexual, questioning, queer, intersex, pansexual, two-spirit, or asexual or androgynous. But that's what people are doing. We are putting sticky labels on ourselves and saying, that's my identity. And the problem becomes when we hold on to things is that they are very transient. If your job is who you are, what happens when you're sacked? Or your job is no longer there. Therefore, I have no sense of identity. Who am I if I'm not my job? It's like uh, years ago. Remember when you were kids, you went to the, the fete or the carnival or the ECA and they'd have these mirrors, wouldn't they? You stand in front and you might be a short person and you're, suddenly you're tall because of the, the way the mirror is curved and so on and they, it makes distorted pictures of you. And that's our problem as a humanity when we try to take our identity of who I am and what I'm about and where I'm going and we take labels from here in the world because it's a distorted view of who we really are because fundamentally we are made in the image of God, are we not? It's one of the cornerstones of identity in the Bible is that God said, let us make male and female in our image, in our likeness. And so as human beings, we are fundamentally hardwired to get my identity this way and not that way. With things, with people labels. Okay? We are hardwired to find our identity in our Creator. And so what we have then is an investigation this morning. Jesus, who are you? How did you understand yourself? How did you understand your purpose? And how did you understand your life direction? You see, it's okay if you know who you are and why I'm here and what I can do, but if the grave is the end point of your life, then what's the point? You need something better than that, don't you? You need to know that your life is going on, that there's hope, that there's some sense that beyond the grave, that the grave doesn't have the last say. And we need to have a piece about these answering these questions because we live in a world that increasingly is at war with our identity as followers of Jesus. Now, very quick, the labels come out to Christians. You're homophobic, or you're a racist, 
or you're a woman hater, misogynist, or you're this, or you're that, or something else, if you don't agree with the labels that we use for ourselves, they will put one on you and me. And certainly Jesus knew these things about himself within the sphere of opposition. And we see it very clearly, don't we, here in John 8, where the Pharisees challenged Jesus, here you are appearing as your own witness, your testimony about who you are, is invalid and it's going to get worse in verse 41 they're going to say well we're not illegitimate children isn't that a bit of a stab eh and like somebody we know mary and joseph weren't married at the time then in verse 46 or verse 48 they say to jesus aren't we right in saying that you're a samaritan and demon possessed doesn't that make you day when someone says that to you and then right at the end of this passage in verse 59, it says that the Pharisees were gathering, picking up stones because they wanted to kill him. So it's within this constant sphere of opposition, particularly within Jerusalem, that Jesus has a peace about who he is, why he's here, and where his life is going. And it's one of the most profound thinkings that we can give to this world, which is so desperately trying to understand who it is. That we can think like Jesus. Okay? So central to Jesus' peace amidst spiritual opposition was his identity, his purpose, and life direction. So, Jesus, who are you? How did you understand yourself? And from the passage that we've read, we've got a, a whole lot of things that he has said here. He says, I am the light of the world. John has all the I am's. John, more than any other gospel writer, tell us, tells us rather who Jesus is. Jesus says in verse 14, I know where I came from and where I'm going. I know where I came from. I am not alone, verse 16, I stand with the Father who sent me. Isn't that precious to be able to say? He says, my other witness is the Father who sent me. My Father witnesses for me. He testifies for me. I am from above, verse 23, I am not of this world. And verse 29, the one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone. Now, Right through to the end of chapter 8, Jesus will go on and on about his identity, but it's too big, we won't have enough time to cover it, so we've just taken verses 12 to 30 today. But Jesus was full of his self-understanding. And for you and me in Christ, how true this is too. For example, Jesus said to the disciples, you are the light of the world, because his light and life lives within us. Jesus says, I know where I came from and where I'm going. I know that my identity is tied up in Jesus. That where he is, is that he rules and reigns in glory, seated at the right hand of the Father. I know that as a believer, I'm not alone. In Christ, I stand with the Father. You know, one of the things we talk about is Jesus is our high priest. That is, he represents us to God and God to us, just as the high priest Aaron and those after him represented the people to God and God to the people. Jesus is with us. My other witness is the Father who sent me. You know, Christ calls himself the faithful and true witness. And Christ on that day will give witness, Father, this man, this woman is mine. They're covered by my blood. They stand in my name. And we too are no longer of this world, verse 23. Isn't that true? We are with him who is above. The one who sent me is with me. Jesus does not leave me alone. Now what's Jesus saying there? Saying this. Central to his identity and therefore ours was knowing whose he was and therefore he knew who he was as the light of the world. 
If you take your, your scriptures there and just cast your mind down to verse 44. This is where the, the theological punch-up really has uh, fisticuffs flying, so to speak. Jesus says to the Pharisees, you belong to your father the devil and you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning. Verse 47. He who belongs to God hears what God says. The reason you don't hear is that you don't belong to God. Now what Jesus is saying is that fundamentally our identity is tied up in who do we belong to? Now in our Western mindset, in our materialism, we tend to think of belongings are possessions. But in the scriptures, belong is fundamentally a relationship word. Ellen and Steve belong to Sue and I. Sue is my wife, she belongs to me. That's not goods and chattel. That's a relationship word. And that's what Jesus means here. Your father is either the, the devil or is your heavenly father. Who do you belong to primarily determines your identity in this life. And for Jesus, his identity overflowed from his sense that I am the father's son. That's why he was so father-centric in all that he did and all that he spoke. I mean, it just drips with the sense that every day he had that conscious sense of I'm, I'm in the Father's presence. I commune with my Father because I belong to him. And because he belonged to God, he had the I am saying. So in that case, it's like I'm Father's light bulb. I'm the light of the world and the glory of God is now manifest in the face of Jesus. That's why he'll say in John 14, Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? <coughs> Jesus' identity was tied up in whose he belonged to. And so is ours. We belong to Jesus. It's the relationship word. That's where my identity is tied up. An Anglican, now Anglican priest, who was a, a former homosexual before he came to the Lord, and a, a great insight, and I'll put the quote here. You won't be able to read it, so I'll, I'll read it for you. But he readily understood this essence of what the world says is identity versus what the Bible says is identity. And uh, he has his uh, lust still, but under the control of Christ. He is celibate, and he does not practice at all. As a Christian, one of the key things for me is realising that identity is not something we discover in ourselves, like the lady at the beginning, eat, pray, love. Nor is it something we create. Our identity is something we receive. And we are given by the only person who can know our actual identity, which is the God who made us. So my identity as a Christian comes from the fact that I've been created by God, redeemed by Him through the saving work of Jesus. Our culture says you are your sexuality. That your sexual feelings that you have are the real you. For me, that's just not the case. My sexuality is not what defines me or what is the centre and heart of who I am. And he is spot on, and I've underlined it there. Because I belong to Christ, my identity is part of the grace and gift of eternal life. I am, by grace, a child of the Father because my life is in Jesus. My identity is something I have received. That's the first thing we've got to settle within our minds. I know who I am because I know who I belong to. Second thing. All right, Jesus, what's your purpose? What's your purpose? What were you here for? And again, we find that Jesus was, sorry, very clear. Verse 12. The reason why I am the light of the world is so that I can take followers from darkness into light. He was teaching, it says as a summary statement in verse 20, teaching in the temple courts. We know he did that all the time. He says, what I've heard from the Father, I tell the world. In verse 28, he said, you will know that my words come true when you lift up the Son of Man. He knew his impending crucifixion was one of the primary purposes that he had. Verse 28, I do nothing on my own but speak just what the Father has taught me. And then verse 29 is, is really just a label for each of us. I always do what pleases him. 
So if we were to ask Jesus, okay, you belong to the Father, you're the Father's Son, what's your purpose? Well, my purpose is to do whatever pleases Him. And for, the, for us, that's our life purpose too. You know, often we get hung up with what is my purpose, meaning who am I going to marry, uh, where am I going to live, what sort of job, what sort of ministry should I be a part of. And uh, speaking over the years with, with people as a pastor, some people really get hung up by that, but, you know, living that I'll always please Him means that I do that in everything. So, uh, you know, if you, you see the kitchen bench and it's dirty, uh, you can serve and you can bless the Lord just by saying, well, I'll all do that. I will take that up. I will bless by doing menial things as well as not so menial things. And everything that I'm about, as I, as I go into work tomorrow, whatever that may be for you as a student or whether you, you, you're at a desk job or with your working machinery, you are consciously taking Jesus with you because Jesus is going to be glorified in my teaching, my accountancy, uh, my carpentry, whatever it is that I do as paid employment, or in my parenting at home, uh, mothering with little ones, whatever it may be, I do that to please my Heavenly Father. And here's the teaching point I want you to see with this. Jesus' purpose flowed from His identity as the Father's Son. He did not do what most of the world does and says, my purpose shapes my identity. Jesus said, no, my identity shapes my purpose. Completely different. Because I'm the Father's Son, out of that identity, everything I do is for my Father. And so it can be menial things, as I said, or it could be a, a paid job or whatever it was. So when he was a carpenter for 18 years, Joseph and Son, Proprietary Limited, whatever it was, Jesus did that to the glory of the Father as much as anything else. And Jesus' purpose was not then, like so many others, to use his purpose to try and build his self-esteem. No, he lived to esteem the Father. And you will find this with the, the Bible writing saints and others. They didn't spend time trying to build up their self-worth. They got lost in God. And they did exactly what Jesus says was the greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. And therein came the blessing and the sense that I am functioning as a man or woman in God doing exactly what I was made to do by my Creator and my Lord. Jesus gave his life to esteeming the Father rather than trying to run and pursue his own self-esteem. And there's a lot in that for us as well. His purpose was shaped by his identity. Not the other way around, as our world so often does. So it doesn't matter, therefore, what I do. And here's another aspect of worldly thinking then. If your purpose shapes your identity, then you're only useful and worthy as a person so long as you can do something. The minute... And particularly, you, you saw this um, decades ago in, in World War II thinking that, uh, you know, we need to get rid of certain people who can no longer contribute to society because they're not worthy. They're too old, too handicapped, too this or too that. They have a lower rating as people of worth because they can't fulfil a purpose that we think is valid. And that's part of the horrible outcome of thinking, of worldly thinking, saying you only have meaning and worth if you can do something. But in Christ, God forbid, but I could be a paraplegic and still <coughs> have just as much worth because I still belong to God in Christ. True? And I can still pray. But my arms can't do anything, my legs can't do anything, I can't do any of what the world would call a, a functional purpose. And yet I can still bless the Lord and please Him in the way that I talk to people or whatever it may be. This is very serious that we think like Jesus, that my identity shapes my purpose. 
It's not my purpose that shapes and gives me worth. It's the other way around. All right? Finally, Lord, where's your life going? All, all well and good to know who you are and why you're here, but if, if it ends when you're 80 or 90 or 100, if God gives you that long, and the grave has the last say, well, what's the point? Might as well live for yourself and not care about others. But Jesus had a very acute sense of where his life was going, and it was eternal. He said, I know where I came from and where I am going. But you don't know where I've come from. You don't know heaven. And you won't know heaven eternally. Because he said twice to them, you will die in your sins because you don't believe who I am. But Jesus had a tremendous sense of where he's going. And throughout John it comes clear. Doesn't it? John 14. Trust in God. Trust also in me. Behold, I prepare a place for you. In my Father's house there are many rooms. Jesus is right now preparing places for his people and he will come back so that we will be with him and share his glory and see his glory. That's what enables me then to live those aspects of purpose that can be so difficult. Because I know even if I give my life, I shall be with him forever because I belong to him. Is the teaching point. Jesus' life direction enabled him to be obedient in the difficult things, namely his crucifixion. And he says in verse 28, you're going to lift the Son of Man up on the cross. And he knew that. But he knew that death would not have the last say. In fact, he said that a bit earlier in John, uh, John 12, I think it is, where he says, the Son of Man, I have authority to lay down my life and to pick it up again. Jesus knew that his life purpose was full of worth because it gave glory to God, but it would continue eternally to give glory to God and he with the Father eternally. And that's what gives us that tremendous sense of I know who I am and whose I am and therefore the purpose in whatever aspect it is. Lord, have the glory. Be honoured. May it be obedience. This is my life worship. And I know that I will be with you forever and ever. We are the most secure and joyful and peaceful people. When we have those things within a culture that increasingly is hostile to you and I who identify as followers of Jesus. One last slide. There's another place in John that just neatly encapsulates these four things about Jesus. And it's that passage that's very familiar. It's the foot washing one. We're going to look at that in a couple of weeks. But it's got these four things. Opposition, identity, purpose and direction. And look how it all works together. The evening meal was in progress and here's the opposition. The devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. So he knows what's going to happen. He's going to be betrayed and you know the story. So what does Jesus do with this opposition that Satan is on the, on the go? It's all coming together now. Does he run? Does he panic and say, boys, uh, someone go, a couple of you go after Judas and tackle him and, and uh, so he can't betray me. No, he doesn't panic or anything. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power. There he is. He's his Father's boy. And that he had come from God. There's his identity. And here's his life direction. And then he is going back to God. Returning. So the sphere of satanic opposition. I know my identity. I know where I'm going. I'll shortly be with him. Here comes the purpose. So he gets up from the meal. Takes off his outer clothing. Wraps a towel around his waist. Pours the water into a basin begins to wash their feet and do what the others were too ashamed or embarrassed to do because that was a slave's job that was the servant's job it's not my job none of us say that do we no good what does Jesus do what's it say 
He is so at peace with who he is. I can do the difficult job of crucifixion or I can do the lowest and most menial of tasks and it is all for the pleasure and the glory of my Father. You see how it all comes together there? And why this is so important that we are able to answer those questions about ourselves this morning. I'm not worth something because of labels that I can apply from this life. I'm worthy because, as Colossians says, your life is now hidden in Christ with God. I belong to Him. You're the Father's son, the Father's daughter in Christ. And you belong. Therefore, your purpose is to give Him glory, whatever the occasion may be. Men, do you know you can vacuum for the glory of God? Have you tried that? A couple of nods. You can dust to the glory of God. You can drive where the traffic is going so slow for the glory of God. That's a bit of a hard one, isn't it, when you want to get somewhere quickly. Whatever I am doing, I do to please Him. That's my life purpose. And I know where I'm going. And that's what makes everything significant about this life. For I will be rewarded by Him. I will reign and rule with Him forever. Can you answer those questions? Do you have that peace that Jesus clearly articulated within a hostile environment just as we do too? I hope you can. And I hope the Lord takes this word and ministers to you and say, Lord, I'm not, I'm not my sexuality. I'm not my job. I'm not this or that. I belong to you and that's where I'm tied to. And your whole life then is one of worshipful purpose to you be with him forever. Amen. Mm -hmm. How about we stand and, and we'll just pray and, and go on our way. Father, I want to thank you for your word today because it addresses the most vital aspect of who we are. And uh, Lord, I, I can only imagine that so many here are thinking of workmates or relatives that they have who struggle with this very question of who, who am I? So they're, they're, they're workaholics or they, they um, Lord, give themselves to causes or they're desperately trying to have a sense of self-worth and significance where, Lord, your arms are extended waiting and calling and drawing for people to know that the only significance we can ever have is tied up in who you are. And so we pray, Lord, that you would help us to shine your light and that that aspect of the light of the world that you would shine through us is that we know whose we are, that our very purpose is everything is for the glory of God. And we thank you we are the most blessed of people, humbly, that we shall be with you forever. So I ask that you would transform our thinking. If some still struggle, Lord, with the sticky labels that the world gives, then, Lord, I pray that in your mercy you'd help peel them off and that we'd wear the only one that really matters, and that is that I belong to the Father in Jesus. Oh, Lord, I pray, take your word for all of us, work it deeply, that it would be fruitful for your sake, I pray. And the saints said, Amen. Amen. Enjoy walking with your father this week. Thank you.